everyone. Um, no, my RMI, welcome to Isthmus. My name is Oyan, I'm an urban designer here. Um, it's awesome to see so many of you tonight and especially like, I think a few of you might have, might be here for the first time tonight, so it's awesome. Um, we've got kind of a three part welcome for the talk tonight. So thank you, Joseph, for the karakia. That was awesome. It for me, enjoy your night. Thank you. Ah, Temiko Toketo, Ko Ben Bambrugan Toko Ingwa. Um, really great to see you all here. Thank you very much for coming out. It's a moment of uh, being a little bit worried with weather and bridges being closed and everything else. And there's always a moment when the 21st person walks in and you go, we've got an event. That's all right. If this is it, we've got an event. But it's fantastic. And, um, you know, looking around, uh, someone said, oh, you know, don't, don't these things just get the normal urbanist crowd? And actually, there's not so many faces that I recognize and people that I know here. So it's great that actually it's, it's a, a lot more diverse crowd than a lot of the kind of urbanist sort of events get. And a much younger audience as well. So, um, yeah, we've got some, some budding, budding urbanists in the making down here as well. And, and yeah, JC, I was looking at you. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so Auckland, like every significant city, uh, it, it needs a place where politicians, professionals and the public can come together to understand the de urban development of a 21st century city. It needs a forum uh, in which to share the hopes, the aspirations, and to work together to shape a better city for all. And that is what the Urban Room is seeking to do. Tamaki Makoto Auckland is at a crucial point in its history. It's a time of great opportunity to reshape this city for a better future. So it is our vision that we equip the city leaders with the imagination and a sense of the city's possibilities um, that now more than ever, we need to, um, we need an independent forum, I suppose, uh, in which to bring people together to dream big, to discuss great ideas, and also to set about making them a reality. So it's our mission at the Urban Room is to con convene the most talented and committed city leaders and enthusiasts to tackle some of the defining issues of this city and its built environment. We are driven by a vision for a better city. One, yeah, one that knows, one that knows where it's going, one that has a clear identity, is sustaining, secure and just. And we're gonna do this through open dialogue at the Urban Room with those talented people, marshalling them around some of the, the tricky issues, but crucially giving them a vital platform in which to find solution-based ideas, or which to express those um, solution-based ideas. And there's perhaps nothing more relevant than the economy of the city. And so it's really great that we've taken the opportunity for um, Stuart and, and Shane, who have been um, here doing, I think, was it today you were doing your, uh, yeah, who've come hot foot from a, uh, a training um, session. But um, when Stuart rang up and said, oh, you know, do you think there's any chance we might host, a, host some kind of event? I thought it was a great idea. And he said, I'll be there in two weeks. And I was like, oh, okay, all right. But um, I'm very thankful for Ismuth who stepped up and said, that they would like to host the event, so thank you very much. And then thanks to MR Cagney and VCL for um, sponsoring. Um, and then I'd also like to thank uh, Rosine Bothlamiskel. It's not gonna be easy with her holding this and the slides. Um, yeah, so Bothlamiskel, Rosine, and Natifatua Orake, who are our sort of founding corporate partners. Um, if you do want to become a founding partner, uh, or your organization, then come and have a chat. We've got opportunities for sponsoring events like this, but we're also trying to build an organization, and that requires not only committed companies, but committed people who are committed to this city and its future. Um, if you do come on board, you get a very snazzy uh, Urban Room t-shirt and tote bag. Um, but most importantly, you get to help set the agenda for what the Urban Room is gonna do. So um, yeah, please let us know. Um, so Stuart, as a former resident of Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, and I think many people um, wish him to come back again. Um, he spent most of the last decade living, working, and studying in Europe and in Australia, uh, especially Amsterdam and Brisbane, where he uh, currently resides. Uh, Stuart is wrapping up his PhD at the Department of Social Enterprise at Freie University in Amsterdam, whilst also working as a consultant at Wiesch Lister Consulting. Stuart's interests include spatial, transport, and urban economics, 
urban agglomeration economics, strategic transport, land use policy. And in recent years, Stuart has delivered uh, several short courses, like the one he delivered today, in urban economics to audiences in New Zealand, Australia, and the Netherlands. But before Stuart, we've got Shane. Uh, Shane Martin is an economist with 15 years' experience in transport and urban economics in both the United Kingdom, uh, sorry, the United States and New Zealand. Uh, he's currently MRC Cagney's principal economist, and Shane is responsible for leading work on the economic analysis and business cases and works closely with data science team. Uh, he has significant experience in modeling, sorry, in modeling the impacts of land use policies and, uh, and housing uh, in New Zealand and land use transport policies together uh, to shape cities. Before his current position at MRC, Shane was the chief economist at Auckland Council, which is where we work together. Uh, I wasn't in the economist department, but um, it was always great to go around and pose some, some kind of tricky questions, um, which always ended up in lots of really, well, kind of irrelevant discussions in the main. But, um, but it was always good, 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 um, good information for the economists. Um, where are we? So he previously worked in the United States, supporting the Department of Transport and the uh, Federal Aviation Administration where lots of good work was canned on the 20th of January 2017 when Donald Trump was inaugurated. I think that's the right date, isn't it? Yeah. And so Shane was selected as part of the Auckland Council Talent Programme, has served, in a, uh, served on a committee of the National Transportation Research Board, presented research at various economics and transport conferences, and was a, a recipient of the Lerner College of Business Excellence in Teaching Award. So between those two, I think most of our questions will have an answer, and we'll have an entertaining and probably a, um, a clear, a clear answer. I think. Um, so we're going to start with with um, with Shane, and we'll take some questions at the end. Well, thanks for having me. Um, as Ben said, my name is Shane Martin. There's what I look like when I dress up once a year. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, he, he touched a bit on this, but uh, this is sort of a new, new venue for me. Um, if anybody has read anything that the Auckland Council Chief Economist Unit puts out, you may have read stuff that I put out, um, usually intentionally a bit provocative, uh, just to get people arguing about it, talking about it. Um, but if not, who am I? I'm not going to go through all this. but. Uh, he got through a lot of this, but really a couple of things I wanted to focus on was, you know, I, I started out my career as a transport economist, and uh, this is mainly because my dad was a helicopter mechanic, and stuff that moves is cool, and but I wasn't good at that, so I had to be related to transport somehow, um, and so that's kind of how I got into it, and, and looked at really interesting questions, at least interesting to me, like, how do airline passengers value their time? And this is really important to like how airlines manage their operations. I wasn't working for the airlines, but the people who own the airports and project these things. I should say I probably have better material for, for this age, <laughs> age group. But um, you know, how do shippers, and I don't mean like you, you sending a, a package to your, to, your, to your granny, but like large scale shippers, how do they choose the modes that they use? How much does reliability matter versus speed? Um, so, you know, just uh, there are certain things where I don't care how fast it gets there, but it has to be here right at this time, particularly in manufacturing. Um, we can order three months ahead, but if it's not here at 2 p.m. on this date, we're all screwed because the assembly line goes down. Um, since I moved here, uh, somewhat randomly, um, Auckland Council advertised a job that sounded really awesome and said, international applicants encouraged, and then I moved here. So um, that's how I ended up here. Uh, the work that I did there that probably got the biggest uh, amount of attention, and if anybody here knows of any of the work I've done, it's probably this, which is around the rub. Does the rural urban boundary make urban land artificially expensive? And the answer is, if you think it does, I'm very stupid and my study is bad. And if you think it doesn't, this is a good piece of work that shows that this doesn't, <laughs> doesn't cause any problems. Um, I actually do think it's a really good piece of work. Um, 
sadly, like all things that are done in 2020 with 2018 data, it's 2023, and is it relevant anymore? I don't know. Um, and then I moved to MR Cagney, which is great. I bought an e-bike because that's what you do when you work at MR Cagney, and uh, uh, just been doing all sorts of really cool work, and I'm really happy to have the invite here tonight. I have a bunch of stuff I want to cover, but I'm not going to cover it in depth because I want to have time for us to have a professional argument at the end around, you know, good discussion, not argument. I mean, maybe argument, but um, hopefully less me talking and more you guys interacting. So I, I, I end with some what I think are kind of provocative questions. Um, future development strategies. We all love these, I think. Um, because they're so clear on what needs to be done at all times. Um, not going to read this, but if you're a big city or a big place uh, in New Zealand terms, you have to have one. Um, of course, big is relative, right? Uh, I've learned that since I moved here. Um, they need to do one with some frequency. And the purpose of the FDS, and I have highlighted here because that's what I want to focus on, is to achieve a well-functioning urban environment. And this is one of those things that I think we can all agree that this is a good thing. This is like politicians running on like, you know, more education, less crime. And it's like, yeah, of course, we're all in favor of this. Um, uh, this is a not controversial thing that we want well-functioning urban environments. I could talk about this I will save you from this. This next one, which I won't mention, that's like a four-hour talk. Um, but happy to have that one sometime. Um, this is a whole bunch of text. It was animated at some point, but no longer. Maybe not. So the MPSUD defines, thankfully, what a well-functioning urban environment means because there are a few words in there that are not defined that we all know what they mean, but when you try to measure it, you're like, but how do I measure if this is enough when you haven't said what enough is? Um, so you have to enable a variety of homes, basically that meet the needs of all kinds of people in all kinds of places and all kinds of price points. And so actually, I'll translate this for you. It's a little tongue in cheek, but Ah, oh, that was supposed to happen one at a time. Um, so have or enable a variety of sites that are suitable for business. Have good accessibility for everyone to everything. Um, support and limit as much as possible adverse impacts on the competitive operation of land and development markets. I think uh, if there are any, I don't know if there would be any treasury folks in this room. I think this is the one that they spend all their time on. Um, support reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and are resilient to the likely and current future effects of climate change. So my, my translation of this is we have to have all homes meet the needs of everyone at all price points in all places, something about business. Uh, all people are close to everything and can get to those things by every mode and doesn't annoy developers and their plans for green field development and is good for the environment and also is not in the places where we already built everything. Um, and that's, that's like my, my tongue-in-cheek summary of this. But the reason I say this, one, is because I'm an economist and this is what counts as funny. And uh, two, um, even if you think I'm being too glib, the point is that the definition of a well-functioning urban environment is a really tough needle to thread, right? Uh, which means that basically any decision or thing that comes up, you can contest or can be contested either legally or in the media, which is sometimes almost even worse uh, for outcomes, um, on one of those criteria, right? Because it's really hard, using my, my definitions here, where to do all of these things and the idea is not that every single project needs to do all of these things, but I feel like it leaves a lot of room for, oh, but that doesn't, that doesn't satisfy D, so we shouldn't do that. Or that doesn't satisfy A, so that it doesn't meet the criteria when it's really a much more holistic thing. 
but I see it playing out as, you know, arguing about each individual thing. Um, so like I said, it's tongue in cheek, but it's probably like 85% right. Um, so what makes the urban environment well functioning? Um, well, all kinds of development could add to those, you know, it could make it better or worse in some ways. You don't have to agree with me on all of these. These are just some examples of like uh, new greenfield development on the fringes might provide more types and certainly by definition uh, provides more location of homes that are available um, because it's a place where homes didn't used to be. So it's sort of, it by definition satisfies that. Maybe that helps with the functioning of the land market. That one is, some people feel very strongly that that is indisputably true. I'm, you know, very much, let's look at the evidence and see if that's true. But it makes things worse by those definitions as well, like having good access to stuff. Um, impacts on the environment often, and in some places, being resilient to climate change. We'll talk about one that's in the news and got lots of people upset. Um, in a minute. And then we have redevelopment or infield and brownfields, which that could also make the urban environment better by having really good access, like putting more people where all the stuff already is so that they don't have to drive to it, but they can walk to it. And having the density that allows good public transport. So instead of the bus running every 15 minutes, you can run it every eight minutes or whatever the thing is. Um, impacts on the environment are often better because you don't have anybody you know, lobbying to like, well, we can pave over these streams and it'll be fine. Um, and even, you know, besides that, like it's just, you're not taking up um, more space, essentially. Humans are not taking up more space because everything we do impacts the environment in some way, right? But it might be worse on some of these, like probably, or, well, by definition, location, you're not making more locations of homes available. You're maybe making more homes available in a location, but you're not making a new location available. Um, and if you're not careful, the functioning of the land market. Um, and this is a thing where, like, housing is really, really expensive in Auckland and in New Zealand and around most of the world. And this is just to say, like, and don't accidentally make it even more expensive if you don't have to. All right, so that's a whole bunch of stuff around what makes it well-functioning and how really this is just their trade-offs. So uh, again, I'm an economist, so everything I talk about has to use the word trade-offs, right? Because they exist. If you do one thing, that means you can't do another usually. And so all of these have trade-offs, and it's our job to try to get the best outcome possible. So. Everything's a trade-off. Every decision probably makes some part of that well-functioning urban environment better off and some other part worse off. But what I would say, it's clear, and this is a weirdly worded sentence, so I'm going to read it. So you, I read it wrong three times, um, and I wrote it. So, you know. <laughs> it's clear we shouldn't be opposing greenfield development and brownfield development, which is what I feel some of the conversation is, is like, uh, what, oh, what's the name for it? Is it bananas? The people who are bananas, right? Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. Yes. So uh, you have that group, which is like, yep, I don't want the city to expand, but I also don't want anybody else moving near me um, or anyone else. So we can't do both of those things and still grow and thrive as a city. Um, None of this is profound. This is just me laying it out, right? All right, so Auckland's new out for consult consultation FDS. So Auckland has a future development strategy, and there's one part of it that I find particularly interesting. I'd be lying if I told you I read the whole thing because it's a future development strategy, and I'm sure whoever wrote it worked really hard on it, but it's a future development strategy, and it's not light reading. Um, but this is the part that I found most interesting, is this map. Um, because this has the proposed changes from the old future development strategy, right? So there's changes in timing 
And then there's this one down here, like recommended for further investigation, which I assume it's like, well, we haven't figured out what we're gonna do there yet. And then there's this other one that I find, I think is gonna be most problematic publicly, um, and I don't think anybody would disagree, is proposed area for removal. So I'm gonna focus in on one of them. That was also much cooler when the animations were there. Um, zoomed in, that's a really terrible resolution, but that's Takanini. Uh, it's roughly this area. Um, if I could, I'll pick on politicians a little bit because fair game, right? If you're flying in from Wellington and you're like, oh, look, there's a bunch of houses up there and a bunch down there and there's nothing there in the middle, why don't we put some houses there? That seems like a good idea. Obviously oversimplifying, but when you do look on a map, that's what you see, right? There's this big empty area. And so we zoom in on that. And then we overlay the old future development strategy. All of the gray is stuff that already exists. The green is open space. And this orange right here, hey, you see this right here? That is the future urban area that was proposed before. Now, when I had just started at Auckland Council, fresh off the, off the plane, I guess, from the US, incidentally, six years ago today, to the date, um, it was weird having my second day of work being Independence Day for US, and all my family is like out in the barbecue and I'm in the rain at work. But, um, so that is the future urban area that was proposed, and I'm gonna do something that I did one of my first times looking at geomaps, and I overlaid the floodplain. And you guys might know where this is headed, but this is the floodplain for that area. And my first thought was, not knowing anything about the politics of all this, of like, ooh, does that really seem like the best place to put a bunch of houses? Um, because, I'm no uh, hydrologist or geologist or whatever, whoever studies what happens when water and earth mix in large quantities. Um, but it seems like this could be a problem and that it wasn't random, going back to this map, that nothing had ever been built there. Like that wasn't like, oh, well, we'll just skip over all this fine land and then we'll go down here, right? There's a reason that it hadn't been built on. And so fast forward to now, this is just a, an excerpt, I don't, I'm not gonna read it to you, you can go look at the FDS, but basically saying the new FDS proposes that Takanini is removed. And why? Because this brand new floodplain that nobody knew existed six years ago um, is basically entirely within the future urban area and you know, a significant portion is also an area where liquefaction damage is possible. Uh, there's this PD loam, which again, I don't know anything about soils, but people who do tell me that's not great to build stuff on because uh, my understanding is it sucks in water and then moves, um, <laughs> which, you know, seems like a bad thing to build on. And so council has said, actually, they haven't said this, they've implied actually, we shouldn't have had this in before, we should take it out. Um, because it's gonna be incredibly expensive to put houses on a floodplain that looks like that. Anyway, um, that's not to say it couldn't be mitigated. This is not a question around should we, but could we, humans are capable of doing lots of things that we probably shouldn't do. And I have no doubt that we could mitigate those, those risks to some extent but the issue is around cost. You might have heard that like Auckland and Auckland Council don't have an infinite amount of money. It's been in the news, right? Um, should we be spending this money on this when you can get lots of development in other places? I think that's why that's in here. Anyway, the economist in me, so apologies, says, oh, if you just priced everything properly, it'd take care of itself, right? So if it costs $600,000, totally made up number, by the way, please do not quote that. Uh, per dwelling to deal with stormwater in Takanini. Yeah, fine. 
charge the developer $600,000 a dwelling, and they'll say, no thanks, not gonna build that, and you don't have to say nobody can build there because nobody will build there because it's too expensive. Um, but this isn't how the real world works with uncertainty and lawyers and cashed up landowners and uh, folks like that because nobody can say with 100% certainty, believe me, I understand. Uh, this is like, um, <laughs> nobody can say, I would have brought magic tricks had I known this was. Um, you can't say with 100% certainty how much the cost to deal with it will actually be. We just have estimates, and it's like, we do this all the time, but you say, well, in 30 years, how much will it cost for us to divert this, this stormwater problem or whatever? And it's like, I don't know. I don't know how much it costs today. I have an idea. 30 years from now, who knows? Um, how many houses would be built there? When would they be built? How bad will the problem be once everything is built? We can't say that with 100% certainty. So kind of what always happens, this is my, my view or reckoning. I don't have a, a, a solid piece of data for this. But developers, existing ratepayers, the government, everybody else ends up sharing the risk. And then when things go bad, everybody pays to fix it. Um, and we're trying to avoid that. All right, so let's talk about infrastructure. I'm gonna go through this really quick. Again, this is not profound. When you read about infrastructure in the news, I often think they're just talking about these things. Um, but infrastructure has lots of other components. It's not just you know roads and running taps and flushing toilets. It is also you know the PT network and footpaths and cycle lanes and paths and really the, the whole transport network Schools, hospitals, and medical services, those are of course not provided by councils, but they have to be provided. Parks and playgrounds and community facilities, all of this stuff is infrastructure, and all of it costs way more than you can possibly imagine. Um, and so, where, where is infrastructure cheaper? Brown fields or green fields? This is where the, I feel like a lot of the argument is around this. And the real answer is, it depends, right? Uh, it depends on what kind of infrastructure we're talking about and where, and what's the time frame, and also who pays for it. Uh, every paper I wrote at Auckland Council could just have this in the title. Everyone wants it, nobody wants to pay for it, and we'll say why it should exist, but they shouldn't have to pay. Um, that's human nature, I also think that that I would be very happy if we all, if I had nice things, but all of you paid for it. Um, and you would all be happy if you paid nothing and everybody else paid for it, but then we would pay zero and nobody would get anything. All right, so brownfield development, this is really where I wanted to get, and I think close to the end. In places where there's latent capacity and in existing infrastructure, we don't have to build a bunch of new stuff. That's the technical term. Um, but if there's, if there's available infrastructure in a place that's not being fully used, again, not a profound statement, um, we should use it. It's more cost effective to do that. Uh, one of the big problems with this is actually figuring out what infrastructure is there, what shape it's in, how big it is, and how much capacity there is. Uh, if new infrastructure, particularly three water stuff, is needed, Honestly, brownfield is probably more expensive than greenfields because in greenfields you don't have to tear up roads and uh, disrupt things. But lots of other types of infrastructure are um, less expensive to provide in brownfield areas. That's a unclear what I meant there. But, well, not to me, to you. Um, lots of other types of infrastructure can be less expensive to provide in brownfield infill areas like transport and social and community services, all those other sorts of infrastructure. Um, we shouldn't be basing our decisions on how much it costs to provide one or a couple of types of infrastructure, and that's kind of where I see the conversation going. This is again just kind of professional opinion. Like I don't, I didn't go through and scrape the, you know, the data from. NZ Herald and stuff and make a graph, though I'm sure somebody on my team could do that in like a half a day. I should have asked him to do that. Um, 
but we shouldn't be making decisions just on like, what's it cost to put three waters in? Uh, brownfield development makes PT. Again, this is probably preaching to the choir here, but uh, on a lot of these, but makes public transport access to basically everything much more viable because when you gather people together, it's much easier to provide them services. This is why uh, Auckland, for the amounts that you pay in rates, you get a much higher level of service than if you live somewhere rural, right? Where basically there's probably a library and three water service, not everything that you get at Auckland Council, from Auckland Council, which is not to say they couldn't do a better job doing certain things, but your value for money is much better in a denser area than in a spread out area. All right, so how do we get more brownfield development? I think this is my last slide. This is the one where I hope we get to argue or whatever. Um, you should allow it in the most desirable places. Probably not restrict heights to those that are commercially infeasible. The reason I mention this is I have the, I have to, I get to talk to lots of developers and uh, they all say the same thing. They're like, once you go above a certain height, it gets really expensive because you have to put lift shafts in and you have to change your type of construction. And that typically is when you go above three stories. But if you only allow them to go to five stories, there's hardly any units to spread that over. And they need to go to 10, really, to make it work economically. Um, and I believe that, right? And when you restrict the heights, you often get nothing or you get three-story walk-ups that will be there for the next 50 to 70 years when you could have gotten something more dense. Um, third one, don't plan to put in train lines and keep everything nearby a single house zone. Just in theory, if somebody were to propose such a thing, that'd probably not be the best idea. Um, stop subsidizing greenfield development. Uh, despite what you might read, it is subsidized um, pretty heavily. Make sure we consider externalities. I'm sorry, I used that word as I'm an economist. So all the bad stuff that comes with it, all right? So uh, make sure you consider like increased greenhouse gases and all that congestion. Um, this one I was hoping we'd get some argument about, right? Stop trying to freeze vast swathes of the city in a moment in time. Um, this is not me being anti-heritage, this is me just hoping to get people excited to talk about it. And provide better PT and active mode options. So these are all the things that we can do to get more brownfield development because those some of the big ticket items like the three waters often do appear to be cheaper in greenfield areas, but of course it's easier to put a pipe in a sheep paddock than it is to put one down the middle of a road where people already live. Like that's not, that's an extreme example, but that's kind of what's going on. But what does it cost to put all the other stuff out in the sheep paddock that's already here or that we have good capacity to provide? And so these are just, I mean, these are just talking points. I'm not even saying necessarily I believe all of these things. Some are purely hypothetical and I won't tell you which ones. But um, yeah, I'm gonna stop there. But really this is just about, I know Council in particular is pretty nervous about the new future development strategy, particularly around the removal of certain future urban areas. And it, uh, nobody there has said this to me, but this is me reading be between the lines of like, kind of admitting that like those shouldn't have been in there to begin with. And so that's why we're going to take them out. But it's really hard to unring that bell and we can probably all guess why, right? Is because lots of people, or maybe just one or two people, bought land there with the expectation that they would be able to build a bunch of stuff and get a bunch of subsidized infrastructure and make lots of money, and now that's being taken away, and if I was them, I would also be opposed to you taking this away from me. So like, um, I think that's where the biggest argument's gonna be, or, I know that's where the biggest argument's gonna be. Um, and it's probably already happening. All right, so I will stop there. I have no idea how long that took, but if we have time for questions or arguments, friendly professional arguments, one of my old colleagues is here. I always talked about 
economists contentiously agree with each other all the time because it's like, I'm right for this reason. And you're like, yes, you're right, but the reason's wrong. And that's why, and we're going to argue about that. So we love to argue, um, love to have robust conversation. So stop there. If we have time for it, we can do it. Cool. All right. Hope you can all hear me at the back. Um, thanks, Shane. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Isthmus, for having us. It's wonderful to be here. Last time I was at an Isthmus event, it was on the other, uh, at the old office, and I actually went there first. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit old. Um, so today, um, Shane's got the best words. You might have noticed that. I've decided to show you some pictures. And... It's going to be um, at a high level of altitude, I would say, almost from space, actually, a lot of them, and I hope that's okay. So I'm going to try and shock you out of your happy little Auckland bubble um, and uh, give you some insights that I think are useful to keep in the back of your mind, um, and I'll try and highlight why I think they're useful. So the big push, I'll talk about the big push first, um, and then the gradual pull, and then I'll finish by talking about how we might sort it out. All right, the big push. You say potato, I say urbanization. And you might think those two things are unrelated, but they're very closely related if you go back a couple of hundred years, right? So recent urban economics research has found that locations in Europe that were more suited to growing potatoes experienced stronger population growth and higher rates of urbanization. What I'm trying to convince you of here is that what happens in our cities is very, very closely linked to what happens in the rural economy. Those two things have, have been intrinsically linked for hundreds of years. And it's still going on in different ways, this sort of wider structural economic transformation. What, what do you think might be the effects of I should say, it should be clear here, what the potato did is it increased the labor productivity of agricultural areas. So we could produce more food with fewer people, and those people moved to the cities, right? So they were pushed into the cities by increased labor productivity. That process is still happening now, and it looks like this in the New Zealand context. In the Australian context, if I was giving this at home, this presentation, I'd show a picture of a mine, right? Now mines and these sorts of dairy processing plants are very productive locations, but they don't offer many jobs. The car park here is relatively small. It looks like about 100 cars, right? And this, this, like, this dairy factory, this dairy processing plant probably services a really large area. I think it's in the Bay of Plenty. That process has been happening for a while. Some clever people, far cleverer than me, writing at the time of the Industrial Revolution in about the 1840s. This is, uh, I think his name's Engels. Some people might know him. Um, he described England's cities and towns as homes for the superfluous rural population. And I mention this because I think often when you have a relatively sort of recent perspective, because we all focus on what's happening now, right? We think that cities have always been winning, you know? That cities are attracting people because they're just great places to be. And the reality is that there's a, there's a double-edged sword going on. Cities are partly attracting people because there's simply no jobs in rural areas anymore. So this graph shows um, sectoral composition in the US. It's very similar for the Australia, by the way. I haven't looked at New Zealand, but I would not expect anything different. Services have grown from about 50% of the workforce in 1900s up to about 85 in 2010. Mining, agriculture, and manufacturing all together now total only about 10%. Um, and you can, see, you can see that here as well. So basically, if you grow up in a rural area like I did, it's actually quite hard to get work there in a lot of ways. Okay. Now those economic processes, they operate at a global spatial scale. So these forces are happening all around the world, more or less, different levels. 
Um, but you see the same, the same trends. Um, this is a graph of the share of population living in urban areas and versus uh, log of GDP per capita. And now that we've been through a COVID pandemic, we all know how to read log scales, right? So basically a positive relationship between GDP per capita and the share of population living in urban areas. Um, where do you think New Zealand and Australia fit on this graph? Do you think we're, we fit the trend or are we a bit weird? We're exactly where we, you think we would be. We're exactly in the middle of the graph. So basically the, urban, the relationship between urbanization and uh, economic levels of economic activity, um, we are not different from what you would expect, basically. We're very normal, actually. We are a passionless urban people. Um, basically, the rural population in New Zealand, we're actually, our rural areas are here are doing better than many countries. Actually, um, rural, er rural populations in many places is falling. In New Zealand, it's mainly flat or, yeah, falling slightly. But all of the growth is happening in urban areas. So those, those are push factors, and I think it's easy to forget about them because we like to think, as urban policymakers, that people are moving to the cities because we're doing a good job. <laughs> you probably are, <laughs> but I should, I should add. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, so one of my observations in the, this urban economics course, that the short course that we're giving over the next couple of days, started today. We've given it, given it once before in Auckland, and it always is amazingly fun, um, and it's great to be back. But even in cities with abundant land, like Brisbane, there is an enormous proximity premium. Okay, so Brisbane has a lot of land, and only about fifteen to twenty percent of people work in the city centre. It's a bit like Auckland. But when you look at what people are willing to pay, so this is dollars per week per bedroom versus commuting time, in 2016 values, on the city center, people paid an average of $160 a week. At this point, you might be getting some insight into why I live in, uh, live in Brisbane, uh, but we can come back to that. Um, but it drops very sharply, right? So even in a city with a lot of land, with relatively low transport costs, where only 20% of the population live, work in the city, people pay a lot to be close to the city. The city has a lot of value. Um, by the time you get out to 60 minutes, you're down to about $100 a week per bedroom, and then after about 120 minutes commuting time, it sort of flat, flattens off. Now, this has policy implications, direct policy implications. When you, shift, when you try and shift development capacity from, say, let's say, uh, West Graylin to um, Point Chevalier. You are moving people away to this, from the city. You have to offer them something in exchange. And these sorts of graphs can tell you approximately what sort of value you have to offer them. You either have to offer them housing that's cheaper or better. And if you're not, then they're getting a worse deal, right? And if they're getting a worse deal, they might not take it. And the, the next best substitute for people that you try and move from, that we try and move from Westmere or Greyland to Point Chevalier might not be Point Chevalier, it might be Brisbane. And this holds again when you try and move people from Greyland or Point Chevalier to Teatitu, which is even further out. Right? It's not to say that you can't do it. You just need to understand how much people value proximity. I should say this data is for Brisbane, but this, the bid rent curve or the this line in Auckland is even steeper. People place an even higher value on proximity to Auckland city centre. For a variety of reasons, it might be that there's more amenity downtown in Auckland. It could be that transport costs are higher, and so people really, really value proximity here. Okay, where does this proximity premium come from? And I'm uh, coming to the end of a PhD, which has taken quite a long time. <laughs> so um, it's about, well, the overall process is like 15 years, but um, I've had to think about these things a lot. And I've been trying to find a way to summarize them for, for people who don't have 15 years, right? So this is my first effort. Um, if you think I could do better, please let me know. 
But one reason why there's a proximity premium is transport costs, right? People want to be close to the city and want to be close to other things, to things that they need to, they want to travel to um, because it's cheaper. But then there's also these benefits of being close to each other. Um, the literature talks about different types of agglomeration economies, matching, sharing, and learning. Um, and I'll talk you through examples of those, just so you understand where these benefits of proximity come from, because I think that, that helps, actually. Um, matching. So this is like the benefits of looking for a job in a location where there's lots of jobs available, right? You have more choice. You can choose between employers, and employers can choose between applicants. So a lot of processes in life involve finding a match, not just at work, uh, but also socially, right? So these sorts of matching processes are relevant, not just to workers and firms, but also people who might be looking for friends or partners. So cities play this role, the engines for matching in different ways. And if you don't know what any of these icons mean, that's fine. <laughs> uh, cities are also engines for sharing. Uh, has anyone been here? Yeah, Rijksmuseum. It's fabulous. Uh, I hope you all get the opportunity to go. It's a museum in Amsterdam that um, you can cycle right through the middle of it. There's a cycle lane right through the middle where there's buskers playing music and there's a vaulted ceiling and it's got amazing acoustics. Um, yeah, so anyway. I'll be there in two weeks. So. Uh, here's an Auckland example. Share, cities help us share things. It makes the cost cheaper per person or the quality higher. You get the choice. Um, this is a graph of the wage premium for a worker in Germany associated with mo in larger cities, so the wage premium in larger cities, and how it changes over time, so with the length of time that they spend in the city. So what you notice is when they first move to the city, they get a relatively small wage premium. And the longer they stay in the city, the larger that premium gets. And do you know what's really cool? Is that the premium stays with them when they move. So it's a learning process. The value of these skills stay with workers even if they move out of the city. So cities are really good for learning is the main message. And there's a lot of evidence on this. There's also bads. There's some things that get worse with size. We all think of uh, traffic congestion, right? So as cities get larger, we think tra uh, cities get uh, more congested. Um, but um, some recent research we've done finds that as cities in New Zealand get larger, crime rates get worse. This is crime rates per, ca per capita on the, on the vertical axis. So crime rates per capita on the vertical and log of the population size. Um, this slope implies that a doubling in cities, city sizing would increase crime rates per capita by about 20%. This is important for urban development, I would say, right? When we're thinking about growing our cities, and most places are thinking about these things, we want them to grow in a way that is safe. So we should be thinking about crime, crime prevention strategies. The example that we give in the paper is street lighting. Um, I'm going to slip from evidence into a reckon now, but my reckon is that Auckland is very dark, right? It's a very dark city, and um, there's actually a reasonably robust body of evidence to show that street lighting reduces incidental crime. So it's just an example of sorts of urban. It's a, an example of how urban economics research, can, I think, should actively inform our urban devel development policies. And if we want cities and our cities and towns to grow in a way that adds, like that makes people's lives, makes people better off, then I think we should be thinking quite broadly about these sorts of things. Okay, sorting it out. So we've talked about the push, and then we talked about the pull, and now what happens when people get to the city? Well, the reality is that different locations have different vibes. And you might think that's a glib association, but this paper um, looked at big five personality traits and its spatial distribution in, in the UK and found very large differ differences in the distribution of neuroticism, conscientiousness, and entrepreneurship. And the nice thing about this study is they then related these psychological measures to a variety of e economic outcomes like population growth and economic growth. And they found that 
this was negatively, uh, economic growth was negatively affected by neuroticism and positively affected by entrepreneurship culture. So people, so, so we often talk about urban contexts and how the context can vary. People differ too in different places, and that's okay. Um, but we might want to understand those differences in our policies. This paper looks at the effects, the effects of historical pollution from coal on the distribution of low-skilled workers in cities in the UK. And it's an incredible paper. It shows that the question that, that, that they ask at the beginning of the paper is, why do so many cities in the UK have an East End? Right? A part of the city in the eastern side that is relatively perceived to be rough and populated by um, low skilled workers. They show that they do some amazing research. Um, more attractive for everybody. Here's another example from the Netherlands. So they observed that in these locations, these neighborhoods that have a lot of social housing, the property values were lower. So um, this is their control, and the dashed line is these neighborhoods, and there was a gap, and they were like, let's randomly select some of these locations to invest in the quality of the social housing. And they went in there and they invested in improving the quality of the social housing. What they found after they intervened was that um, the gap disappeared. This is the price of private housing in these neighborhoods. So what they're showing is that this investment in social housing had spillover benefits for the private landowners in these areas. The gap didn't just disappear. By the end, these uh, social housing neighborhoods are actually valued more. So that's <laughs> quite cool. Um, this is an example of how policy can bring amenities to people, right? We're, we're going into areas that might be um, considered low, uh, low skilled, low income, whatever, and we're saying we're going to invest in, in the quality of the housing and we're going to lift that area up. This is a bit wordy, um, but the other option is we take people to the amenities, right? And you can do that with transport. It's a little bit of an imperfect substitute. This study um, from the US, it was an amazing program called Moving to Opportunity. If anyone hasn't heard of it, I recommend you look it up. They offered vouchers to a bunch of people who were on welfare. Um, the program was oversubscribed, so they randomly selected people to, to get the vouchers, and they were able to use these housing vouchers to move from their high poverty area to a low poverty area, right? And then they, they tracked their outcomes over time. This abstract kind of understates it. Where they say we find that moving to a lower poverty neighborhood when young, before the age of 13, increases these outcomes, the earnings were like 30% higher for people who moved from high poverty to low poverty. That's enormous. I can't think of any other socioeconomic intervention. Now, obviously, there's a lot of things bundled in here, right? Like, especially in the US, you have relatively large differences in school school quality and school investment. So the next stage of this sort of research is trying to unpack what contributed most to those improvements and outcomes. And that's going to be really useful for, pol for policy. But, you know, this is huge. Um, it's a huge problem and also an opportunity if you're going to do glass half full. Okay, summary. And then we can throw it open to questions. Um, so the push, what I'm really trying to impress on you is that urbanization partly reflects long-running changes in the structure of the global economy that are pushing people into cities, okay? The big stuff beyond our control. I know we like to focus on Brisbane and Auckland and think about what we're doing, but um, to some extent, we're still responding to these, to these forces. They're somewhat beyond our control. The pool, um, transport costs, obviously, we want to, you know, people want to be close to things because to, to, it's uh, lower transport costs. There's also these agglomeration economies, um, and that gives rise to a proximity premium that pulls people into cities. But there's also bads, and, and I gave the example of crime, um, as well as uh, congestion and traffic congestion, which I'm sure you all know about. And this final point about sort, once people in firms move into cities, they will sort across locations. 
Now, some of that sorting is fine. You know, people who like beaches might sort to beaches and people with children might sort to be close to schools. That sort of sorting is fine. But when the sorting, the sorting can go too far, right? So there may be sorting driven by differences in income, which might not be optimal or ideal from a policy perspective. So we need to look at our cities and understand, you know, what's driving the sorting? Is it, is it just differences in preferences or is it differences in income? Um, worth mentioning here that political processes can reinforce the sorting in really unhealthy ways. Um, I remember reading once about a proposed development in Arake where the, a person at a public meeting stood up and said, the sorts of people who live in apartments are not the sorts of people who live in Arake. Now that was 2007. I'd like to think we've gone, we've progressed since then, but you know, glass half full. Um, What's that? <laughs> no. Um, someone else famous. Um, these sorts of, so our local government processes can actually amplify the sorting process in really unhealthy ways, right? So you get people with preferences for certain things and high income moving into areas, they seize the levers of power and then they prevent other people from moving in. There there's, can be a very unhealthy dynamic feedback in sorting and so I think you really need to watch it closely. It's not all bad, but it can be bad. Um, just a footnote here, um, you might wonder whether Australia is sensitive to some of these problems but you've got to keep in mind that we have compulsory voting and so we get 95% turnout in local government elections. So when you wonder why Queensland in particular has had relatively better housing outcomes over time in terms of building housing, I think that helps you understand why. Um, final comment. This is a nut that I think Shane alluded to in his, in his talk um, that I'm still grappling with. But as an economist, we want to combine, you know, with an urban economic lens, I think we want to combine really flexible housing supply with certainty around infrastructure. And how you do that, I don't quite know. <laughs> because it's imp I think we need to. Many objections to policies to allow more housing often point to perceived or real inadequacies in uh, the supply of infrastructure. Obviously, you don't know if people are telling you the truth, but let's just take it at face value. One thing I will say that I think economists haven't communicated well is how better price signals, for example, congestion and parking pricing, they help to align the demand for and the supply of infrastructure. They help those two things to match up, right? So you're, you're setting your congestion pricing, you're setting your parking prices so that you don't get in enormous congestion on your roads and you don't get excessive for dem demand for parking so that people can't find, can't find parking. And they generate revenue that it, where you do see high demand, you can try and provide more of what people want or something else that is good, like you know public transport improvements or active loans. So I think there's a, there's a political economy hook. Now I know price signals are very uh, controversial often and there's no guarantee that the people who oppose housing will necessarily support <laughs> these price signals, but I think we should try. I think we should try. And I think it might help our efforts to boost housing supply if we find a way to, to improve the way we deliver infrastructure, broadly speaking, not just network infrastructure, but social infrastructure. And that's it. That's all I got. So I hope that was worth your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was uh, excellent stuff. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a, one of the takeouts is about this integration point, is that we're probably not having enough of those conversations that have a slightly broader aspect to how we deliver things like a future development strategy. Um, but I'd thank Oriane for hosting us and being involved in things. Thank you very much. And just finally to uh, thank Ismus, thanks, uh, MRC and VLC uh, for their contribution in supporting us as well. That's really important. And thank you all for turning out on a, on a very windy, windy yeah. kind of night.